September 5, 1940, 19,000 feet above the English Channel. The sky is chaos. Tracer fire cuts through the pale blue like fiery needles. The sound of machine guns echoing in the cold morning air. Beneath, the channel glitters like shards of glass, a mirror of the war raging above. A lone hawker hurricane Mekwai, paint scorched and wings riddled with bullet holes, claws its way upward through the thinning air. Inside the cockpit, Flying Officer Alan Wright grips the control stick so tightly his knuckles turn white beneath his gloves. Sweat trickles beneath his oxygen mask despite the freezing temperature. Ahead, a Messerschmitt BF-109 climbs hard, sunlight flashing across its polished fuselage. The German fighter is fast, too fast. Everyone in fighter command knows it. The 109's Daimler-Benz DB-601 engine gives it a brutal advantage in acceleration and climb rate. Against it, the hurricane is outdated, slower, less streamlined, a relic from another time. And yet, something is different. Wright pushes the throttle all the way forward, expecting the familiar rattle and groan of the Merlin engine nearing its limit. But instead, the engine responds with a smooth, almost eager surge of power. The airspeed climbs past 300 mao. The hurricane begins to gain. The BF-109's pilot glances back, surprised to see the slow British crate holding tight on his tail. Wright doesn't know it yet, but he's flying one of the few hurricanes equipped with a forbidden propeller, a secret modification that was never officially approved by the Air Ministry. It was the work of a few desperate engineers at Rotol, a small propeller company that believed the hurricane could still fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with the 109, if only someone dared to break the rules. You can almost feel the air compress around the propeller blades, biting harder, pulling the aircraft forward with renewed fury. The Merlin engine growls with new life. This isn't just horsepower. It's efficiency, precision, and defiance of bureaucratic limits. Down below, over the white cliffs of Dover, air raid sirens wail. Civilians stare skyward, watching contrails twist and vanish. No one down there knows that above them, in this single moment, a secret experiment is proving itself in combat. Wright squeezes the trigger. The Hurricane's 8303 Browning machine guns erupt in a synchronized blaze. The tracers cut through the air, crossing the gap in seconds. The German fighter jinx left, but not fast enough. Bullets rip through its tail section. Smoke trails behind it. The BF-109 dives sharply, trying to escape, but Wright stays glued to its six o'clock. His Hurricane is faster in the dive now, smoother, more stable. This wasn't supposed to happen. Every RAF pilot was trained to break off when a 109 went vertical. Now, for the first time, a hurricane could follow. And it all started weeks earlier, in a dusty workshop in Gloucestershire, far from the front lines. Inside a small hangar, a team of engineers stood over a stripped-down hurricane propeller hub. Among them was Leslie Fries, a designer from the Rotol Company, and George Bullman, one of Rolls-Royce's top test pilots. The two men had been quietly collaborating after hours, frustrated by the limitations imposed by the Air Ministry's red tape. The Hurricane's fixed-pitch propeller was efficient at low altitude, but a disaster above 15,000 feet. The BF-109, with its automatic constant-speed propeller, simply left it behind. So they broke the rules. Using parts scavenged from early Spitfire prototypes and experimental Rotol assemblies, they crafted a new constant-speed variable pitch propeller that allowed the Hurricane's Merlin engine to maintain peak efficiency across all altitudes. It wasn't approved, it wasn't documented, and it wasn't even officially funded. But it worked. The propeller's secret lay in its governor mechanism, a device that adjusted blade angle in real time, based on engine RPM. It meant that instead of wasting power pushing against air resistance, the blades could bite just right, converting more torque into thrust. The result? A climb rate improvement of nearly 1,000 feet per minute and a top speed increase of over 25 melodome. For a fighter locked in a life-or-death dance with the 109, that difference was everything. When the first modified hurricanes took to the air at RAF Northolt, even the most skeptical pilots were stunned. It's like flying a different machine, one test pilot wrote. The engine sings instead of groaning. She just wants to go higher. But officially, the modification remained off the books. 
The Air Ministry refused to risk reliability issues or mechanical failures in combat, not realizing that inaction was deadlier than any gamble. Back in the cockpit, Allen Wright's hurricane closes the gap. The BF-109 tries another desperate maneuver, rolling inverted and pulling into a half-loop. Wright follows, the stick heavy, his arms screaming in pain, his breathing shallow through the oxygen mask. He feels the aircraft tremble at the edge of stall, but the propeller keeps pulling, dragging him upward like an invisible hand. The German pilot can't believe it. Hurricanes don't climb like this. They can't, but this one does. At 21,000 feet, the BF-109 stalls out. The hurricane swings in behind, guns lining up perfectly. A short burst, one second. The German fighter bursts into flames, trailing black smoke as it falls toward the channel. Wright exhales for the first time in what feels like minutes. His heart is pounding so hard it feels like part of the engine. He knows what just happened wasn't luck. It was something else, something new. When he lands back at base, mechanics swarm the aircraft. The propeller is coated in salt and oil, but still perfect. Word spreads quickly. Wright caught a 109 in a climb. Pilots gather, disbelieving around the hurricane's nose. Freeze and Bullman, quietly observing from the sidelines, exchange a look that says everything. Their forbidden creation had worked. In the days that followed, more hurricanes were fitted with the same experimental propeller. Squadron by squadron, they began to close the speed gap against the Luftwaffe. The results were undeniable. Kill ratios improved, survival rates climbed, and pilot morale soared. The Hurricane, once the slow workhorse of the RAF, became a hunter again. But even as the secret spread, the engineers who made it happen faced reprimand. Technically, they had violated Air Ministry procedure, risking the loss of government contracts. Yet when the data was reviewed, when the combat reports came in, the order changed from silence to urgency. Every operational hurricane was to receive the constant speed propeller as quickly as possible. By late 1940, the modification that had once been forbidden became standard issue. It was the unsung turning point of the Battle of Britain, a quiet act of rebellion that changed the course of aerial warfare. And so, on that morning over the Channel, when Alan Wright's hurricane defied the odds and brought down a Messerschmitt that should have escaped, it wasn't just a victory for one pilot. It was a triumph of innovation over fear, of field ingenuity over bureaucracy. The sound of his Merlin engine fading into the horizon wasn't just the hum of metal and fuel. It was the echo of a nation learning that sometimes, the fastest way forward is to ignore the rulebook. Wright's hurricane returned to base with half a tank and a full heart, unaware that his dogfight would go on to prove what the engineers had risked everything to prove, that even in war, impossible is just a word.